All right, I think we will get uh, started with our panel this morning. Thank you all for being here. Welcome to uh, the Friday sessions for the HLS uh, Bicentennial. It's a real honor for me to be moderating this uh, terrific panel here this morning. Um, not with, as Kendra was pointing out, this kind of room seems to lend itself to cold calling. We won't do that, but there are some <laughs> people in the room I know already. So we are seated with people who have a great interest in this topic. So we're going to talk for a while and then we're going to open things up for conversation with those of you in the room. Um, we have till 1030. And um, uh, so again, we'll, we'll, we'll do some uh, panel discussion here and then be sure to to draw you all in. This is a topic that we're talking about today that's of great interest to me. It's of, of significant interest to folks at the law school. Um, it's been of interest to people at the law school going back uh, quite a while. Edwina and I have been emailing a bit about some classes that she taught here quite a while ago on topics related to technology and law. And um, we have uh, Jack Cushman on the panel who currently teaches a programming for lawyers class here today. Uh, and uh, the, the basic gist of this, I think, is to talk about what we want to be teaching as law teachers uh, to law students about technology. Now, that's not technology law, necessarily. Um, we have, and I've always had, lots of great classes here on intellectual property and privacy and security and online speech and those kinds of topics. Uh, nor is it specifically about sort of technology practice skills training. My role here at the law school is to run our cyber law clinic where I work along with Kendra, which is our tech law and policy clinical program. And we give students the opportunity to work with startups and computer programmers and others on legal issues that they face. And that's a great, but this is really about responding to the interests of students and kind of getting under the hood. So this is about coding. This is about technology literacy, um, that sort of thing. Um, we have, again, a great panel here today. Rather than sitting here and reading bios, I'm going to give you a very quick introduction, and then I'm going to ask each of them to maybe say a few words about who they are and the perspective they begin they bring to the conversation. To my left, Mitch Resnick from the MIT Media Lab, a friend and regular collaborator with us uh, in the clinic and the founder of the Scratch uh, platform, which some of you may know. Um, for my eight-year-old, Mitch is a very uh, is, is a hero because he's a big fan of the Scratch uh, platform, but it's really the primary, uh, the, the preeminent uh, sort of online uh, learn to code platform for kids um, these days. A really extraordinary project. To Mitch's left, Kendra Albert. Kendra uh, is an HLS alum. Uh, they work with me in the Cyber Law Clinic and uh, spent the past year in uh, tech practice out in Northern California before we will, were able to lure them back and join us uh, to teach and practice in our clinical program. Uh, next, Jack Cushman. Jack is a uh, lecturer on law here, as I mentioned, has developed and is and co-taught, uh, taught for the first time last spring and will co-teach again this spring our computer programming for lawyers class. He's also based at our library innovation lab, which is a really extraordinary place that I hope he talks a little bit about and as a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. And last, but by no means least, Raj Goyal, HLS alum, former Kansas State representative, um, lawyer, tech geek, um, co-CEO of Bodala, which again, I think, uh, I hope he'll um, tell us a little bit as uh, about as well. Um, Mitch, can I start with you? Mitch is our token non-lawyer on this panel, I should say, um, which is great. Um, and you always, you always talk need a little diversity. Bit. Chris. You <laughs> <laughs> Maybe say a few words about your work and, and sort of how you come to the topic of teaching about technology, teaching about coding. So, well, first, thanks for inviting me. And um, although I'm not a lawyer, I will say sometime in my background, at a time of great indecision in my life, I did apply and was accepted into Harvard Law School. Really? No, but no. did not come. So that's a, a, a secret that most people don't know. So, well, it's, it's fixed on camera now for, the, for all eternity. So, yeah, terrific. Uh, but uh, as, as Chris mentioned, uh, I'm a professor at MIT Media Lab and run the Scratch Program Language Online Community, which it's, we launched 10 years ago and has grown to an online community of more than 20 million registered members of kids around the world, largely ages 8 to 16, where kids program their own interactive stories, games, and animations, and then share their creations with one another in a very active online community uh, that gets every day, there's more than 200,000 new projects that kids around the world create. Uh, and an equal number of comments where they comment on each other's projects. Through this, through our work on Scratch, we've interacted a lot with this cyber law clinic on everything from the use of copyright material in the online community, you know, trademark infringement, issues about uh, child data privacy, uh, issues around what are our obligations of informing authorities or, or teachers or parents about certain 
activities that are happening. So there's lots of issues, legal issues that come up. It's been great to work together with, uh, with Chris and others at the, at the Cyber Law Clinic. Um, one thing maybe to highlight is as we started Scratch and as we continue with Scratch, our goal was not to prepare the next generation of professional computer programmers or computer scientists. Although some kids might very well end up with that, but that was definitely not our goal. Our goals, our feeling is that it's valuable for everybody uh, to learn to express themselves creatively with new technologies and coding is a good way of doing that. So we see the goals of Scratch is to help people not just you know, learn particular technical skills, but to develop their thinking, to be able to think systematically in new ways, to be able to develop their voice so they can express their ideas in new ways, and develop their identity to feel that they can be an active participant and contributor in a society where technology is playing a really central role. So I think the same way that we, we try to view it truly as a type of literacy, the same way we don't teach people to learn to write because we expect them to grow up to become professional writers, it's, that's our same goal with 18, 18 to 16 year olds. So we're interested to see how our goals with that community mm -hmm. translates over into some of the discussions around what happens at law school. That's great. Thank you, Mitch. Kendra? Well, I'm, I feel like it's hard to follow up on for, from someone who's taught so many folks how to like maybe, if not to learn to code, then how to be excited about like uh, the practice of computer programming and tech, technology more generally. Um, but I sort of admit I was a little surprised when Chris asked me to be on this panel um, because my, my contributions in, besides being a technology lawyer, uh, include one year of Java in high school, which I think <laughs> went quite well, uh, but I chose not to continue with. Um, and then a sort of failed series of attempts to learn Python um, about before I started law school. Um, and I think one of the things that I think a lot about when I think about the practice of technology and uh, both technology law and sort of more technology literacy more generally is, you know, when I started learning Python before I tried to, before I went to law school, one of the things I was looking for was a sort of broader sense of technology literacy. And I thought that one of the ways to do that was by learning a specific programming language. So I did, you know, all the perhaps all the right things, perhaps all the wrong things. I joined the Boston Python users group, which was very kind to me. Um, and then I did uh, Project Euler problems, which are these sort of like little math problems to teach you to like start exploring different functions in the language. And I discovered that I was not learning any of the things that I wanted to learn. Um, <laughs> And so I think, you know, more broadly, often people turn to learning to code and use the phrase learning to code when what they mean is, as Chris said, technological literacy, sort of understanding the fundamental, uh, uh, the fundamental like ways in which technology works um, and what technology can do and can't do. And I'm, I'm previewing Jack's, what Jack is probably going to say a little bit, but I think that you know, I think of technology literacy as important for all kinds of lawyers because it helps us evaluate the claims that people make. It's the equivalent of being able to understand, you know, basic statistics to sort of feel like see how whether an expert is uh, is uh, telling the truth or not. So I think that when you know, I, I technology literacy is incredibly important for my practice because I work on computer security. So it's literally my job to sometimes be the go between between the lawyers who do not understand computers and the, the the client who does. Um, but the more broadly, I think that when we ask people to evaluate the claims of like te technology as it's being used in courts, in the workplace, in society more generally, that requires like a baseline understanding of how computers sort of work and what they what they're currently able to accomplish. So if I like were able to sort of get, you know, law students to think about these kinds of things, and sometimes I try to even um, as part of my teaching practice, like I would rather them be able to understand that the word algorithm is more should be more closely substituted with complicated math um, than than sort of learn how you know how to write a script in Python. So I think that val like uh, good technology literacy teaching teaches people to unpack concepts and to, to cl more closely relate them to what they're uh, what they already understand. That's great, Jack. Sure. Uh, I was a little worried about where. Kendra was going with that introduction because, <laughs> because I do teach Python to Harvard Law students <laughs> as a way to teach them technical literacy. And, uh, if I'd taken it I, from you, I probably would have stuck with it. I hope so. I'm starting to feel a little guilty, though, because uh, it is the risk that we have this idea that this will make an impact, and it might turn out that it doesn't, and uh, we don't have really many models to work from. Uh, our course is inspired by another course that was taught at Georgetown by Paul Ohm and Jonathan Frankel for one year, and we looked at them and we said, that's great, let's try it. Uh, and now we're trying it. We think it's making an impact, but 
they might look back and say, you know, sorry, Kendra, that was wrong. Uh, but here's why we think it's making an impact. Uh, for me, the, the term technical literacy is almost too small for the thing that we're struggling with right now. I sometimes say computational thinking, although that also feels small. Uh, the, the core thing that's happening is that our world is being rewritten by technology and lawyers have to help us make sense of that. Uh, I saw that as a uh, first a computer programmer and then as a lawyer myself practicing appellate law in Boston. Uh, of course, being a computer programmer and then working as a lawyer, I kept seeing opportunities to, oh, I could script that up and we could save that person 20 hours if I write this thing or we can win this case if I write this thing. Uh, but that wasn't the biggest part of it. The biggest part is that when you practice Appellate law, you have to win by explaining to the judge where the law should go. You tell them a story about if you make this decision, then the law will move in a good direction and you will have done your work as a uh, you know, Supreme Court judge. And uh, when you start thinking about where the world is going, you see that every bit of the world is being fundamentally altered by the technology that we now have and altered fast. Uh, I was reading in preparation for this sort of, how is document review changing? How is the demand for first year associates changing? And you read these things like, the practice of document review has fundamentally changed in the past five years. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, you know, each of us could pick our, you know, what changed for me since 2012 or since 2007. Uh, but if you think about it changing fundamentally in the past five years, uh, that's not a sort of legal practice requires you to learn the new stuff problem. That's a, uh, People who are graduating from law school now, when they made their decision to go to law school, the practice has fundamentally changed since then. Someone who asks you now, should I go to law school? The right answer is, I only know the legal profession in 2017. I don't know it in 2021. I don't know if you should go to law school. Uh, and that pace of change requires this thing that we call technical literacy, computational thinking, the ability to see how it is that the world is going to be rewritten not only because document review is going to change, but because uh, we rely on lawyers <laughs> to make the world work after technology breaks it. And when we're training lawyers, they have to be able to then go out and do that. Uh, so that's what I hope my class is able to do, and maybe we'll get into uh, how it does that as we go along. That's great. Yeah, well, yeah. good morning. That, that could not have been a better segue, actually, Jack. I'm honored to be here, and I'm, I gave a talk at uh, at uh, Berkman that Chris had me last year, and I'm shocked you invited me back. So thank you, Chris, uh, for, for many reasons. But uh, I tend to uh, find myself to be a bit of an outlier on most of these panels and, and, a, and a fairly strong critic of this institution. Uh, and, and I think I will say some things that um, I don't think any probably speaker will say about what's actually happening in our profession and, how, um, uh, and what a failure the, our industry and profession really is. Uh, but but I'll, I'll get to that later. But to Jack, I'd love to. I'd love to uh, uh, and then we can talk about Kansas politics anytime anyone wants to. But, uh, because I have this logical thread of being a state rep out of Wichita, and now I live in Tribeca and run a tech company. So, you know, I, I, I like nonlinear progressions. But um, to, to Jack's point, which is exactly right, which is I would not counsel, and I, I am asked because I do have an extensive political background about advising young folks if they want to go into law school and so on, and this default degree that we sort of, uh, I'm 42, um, and so, you know, from 25 years back, oh gosh, you know, when I was, I was making these decisions, you know, I, I don't think I could counsel anyone in good conscience to actually say, oh yeah, law school is a great place to go, it's a general thing, you know, figure it out. Um, and I will tell you, and I say this from the front lines, um, you know, it, it is great. Uh, obviously, you know, academics have have a have a role. Um, my bias is toward doers, and so I actually run a technology company that is on the leading edge of doing everything that Jack was talking about. So we are transforming the practice and the industry of law. So the discussion of in our in my view, and I say I'm going to say we a lot because this is sort of my company and my co-founder, who is also an HLS graduate of '99. Uh, we sort of think uh, about this in, in, in a similar way, which is, so should the discussion be, should lawyers in the law do coding and so on? I, I think absolutely. I mean, it's sort of like a no-brainer. Of course, all of this great stuff should happen. I mean, would anybody reasonably argue that the law should not get more facile in technology? You'd have to be a complete moron to think that. Um, and so, you know, but the real, I think that the bigger question, again, King Alfred Jack, is, is that the AI revolution 
of which we are one leading edge in this industry, and the law has been hugely backwards when it comes to technology, I mean laughably backwards, which is why there's white space for a company like ours to develop, is actually missing, in our view, the main point, which is it's not really about these policies and what the pedagogy should be. It's actually about making markets. And uh, again, as Jack was mentioning, the market is changing very, very rapidly because the law for 50 years has been able to survive in its current form due to a, a complete lack of any market transparency. So only in monopolistic markets typically do you have the supply side setting prices. But in our industry, so I loved when you said, oh, I could write a script to save 20 hours. You'd be fired from that law firm. Why the hell would a law firm want you to save hours billable? I mean, it's like, I mean, it, it, it's like to anyone who's in the real world of this, it's like, it, it's not even, uh, I mean, it, it, it's like arguing, you know, night is day and day is night. That is absolutely antithetical to the nature of the institutions that actually run the legal industry. And so you have to think with that frame, really. And so our view is that the way that intelligent software and AI will actually affect our industry and the profession will be that it's going to change the market very rapidly, and we're seeing this. We are a software provider for some of the largest corporations in the world, and now some of the largest law firms in the world. And the law has lacked what um, actually a McKinsey, the head of the McKinsey Legal Practice calls an OS. There is no operating system of the law. It's essentially a bunch of siloed areas, and they don't they talk to each other a little bit, but everybody, uh, you, you know, it is not actually a wholly, uh, you know, a, a tapestry like it is in other industries. So I would just conclude this little uh, point with an analogy, which is if you look at the way pricing transparency has changed other industries, it's really not about robots eating jobs or so on. If you look at Google and Facebook. What have they done? They've destroyed the advertising market. So it's a market force where they came in and essentially if you're doing any advertising within a really rapid amount of time, they have completely destroyed the existing status quo of advertising. That's actually how you get transformational change. It's not necessarily because, um, you, you know, again, that's the power of the private sector versus uh, and having have an extensive background in the public sector and believe very passionately in it, uh, you know, our, our bias from sort of our, our view of the world is that you have to watch these market forces far more uh, uh, closely than is actually being done in, in the academy. So much there. Uh, lot, lots of threads I, I'm going to try and start to weave together. Um, that was, those, are, those were great intros. One of the things I think I heard from all of you was sort of this, trying to draw this line between um, understanding how technology works, understanding how code works specifically for the purpose of writing a program uh, or writing a script or you know, generating a privilege log for a lawyer or creating an iPhone app for a, a general programmer on the one hand and understanding how coding works for purposes of gaining general computational thinking skills, technology literacy, tech fluency. And I'm curious, Mitch, if you, if you have thoughts as you as you are on the earlier stage of teaching kids to engage with this stuff, you, you started by saying not all of these kids are going to grow up to become computer programmers. But can we drill down a little bit on exactly what we think kids are learning when they are learning uh, coding skills, if not the um, the sort of the logical sort of practical result of coding skills, which is the ability to write software? Yeah. Well, some of it, oftentimes people start by saying you get a type of systematicity in your thinking. And I think that's true, but it doesn't go far enough in that uh, actually, there was some comparison that was made about learning math, yep. and that you know is this just sort of, is it equivalent of learning math? And although it's equivalent in some ways, I think there's an important difference. Uh, in fact, one thing that was really influential to me uh, when I was first getting involved doing things with computer science, I read this book. Uh, I'd always just <laughs> seen computer programming as just to get a job done. It was very functional, my view mm -hmm. of it. I'd learned programming, get a job done, and then there was this computer science textbook from MIT that said. Computer programs should be written primarily for people to read and not for machines to execute. <laughs> and I said, what does that mean? You know, that, that, that's shocking. I thought it was this operational thing to get a job done. And what they meant by that is it's a way of expressing ideas. And it's a different way of expressing ideas than mathematics is. Mathematics generally expresses declarative knowledge. There's a fact. This is true. Mm -hmm. There's equality. Computer programs describe process. So one reason I think learning programming is valuable is it gets you thinking about process and gives you a description of process. It's a new way of describing process. And we've always been very bad at describing process and thinking about process. And actually, in the field of law, it's important to think about Absolutely. process. So 
whether, I'm not saying that everyone should write a computer program to describe the processes that you're studying, but it gets you thinking about process in a way that I think few other things do, yeah. I think in a very valuable way. That's great. Uh, Jack or Kendra, does that resonate with either the way you've, you're teaching these skills or, or Kendra, the way you've thought about them in your, in your practice? I think one, actually, you know, if I were going to be like, why I should, if I were trying to come up with the most compelling reason why uh, students should take Jack's class, well, maybe not Jack's class, but a class in computer programming, I would actually think that uh, it has, you know, one thing I, I always think about is how many other places this conversation is happening, right? How many other people can set up here, and I'm pretty sure there's actually a panel later on, how the law should be like learning statistics, or how the law should be learning more about like all of these different subjects. And so I think one of the most valuable things that students can get out of um, learning, learning programming is not just the systematized thinking, but like learning to deal with failure and like learning to deal with the idea that they don't know everything and they're not going to know everything. And I think that actually, you know, I, you know, I don't mean to, I, I'm going to join Raj's like down on law school train a little bit in the sense that, uh, you know, despite teaching at a law school, mm -hmm. in the sense that I actually think we're really bad at teaching law students how to how to fail mm -hmm. and how to like how to find things really hard and have that not be um, not be a like a sign that you're doing it wrong. If I could just chime in on that, I, I totally agree. It's important to try things that are challenging. But beyond that, another thing that I find really valuable about programming is that it's a good way you learn about debugging. Mm -hmm. that compared to a lot of other things, you can see when something works and you can incrementally try to fix it. So it's not just helping you see that you're not necessarily good at something and experience failure, but also learn how to deal with failure and incrementally and iteratively improve it. And of course, you do that in everything you do. You write a paper, you incrementally improve it. But programming tends to be a particularly good context for learning about the process of iteratively, iteratively refining things, which I think is so important in so many things, and how to deal with failure by iteratively refining and adapting to the way you deal with it. Can I just follow up one other thought about the... Uh the programming teaches you the process, that if, if whatever it is you're studying, programming makes you say very clearly how the process works. Uh, from a legal teaching perspective, that has a huge opportunity. Uh, if you want to teach something like systems thinking, if you want to teach, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's implement this very practical thing, like how does someone move through the immigration statute? Uh, and we will then have to think very clearly about how that statute works on a functional level. But that also opens up great teaching opportunities for talking about how that statute works in a, a systems thinking level, on a social level. What changes would we recommend? And then we can test those with the program. Uh, so it's, it's not just now you're better at thinking about a practical process, but it's if you, uh, if you have the right sort of teaching in place, then you can say, uh, now let's learn to have all kinds of other process thinking that will make you more effective. Mm -hmm. That's great. Raj, I'd be curious from you, it, it, both you and Jack talked in the introduction about um, about the rapid change of the practice, which is true for, I think, all, everyone in the room who practices law has seen this. Um, uh, how, do you, how, do you th how do you think we should be preparing students to be using technologies like Bodala's, like other other yeah. legal technologies out there that use artificial intelligence that, to Jack's point, assist with discovery, that sort of thing? Is training them to use those platforms enough or is giving them a look, again, under the hood uh, essential to, to having them think critically about these things? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. I, so. Uh, you can probably predict him from my opening comments. Yes, of course you should do that because yep. I think that what's happening in the law, so let's take the document review point. So what happened there is, um, and I know we have a distribution of ages in the room, so I think there's probably somebody here who started their career in a dusty warehouse looking through <laughs> banker's boxes doing what's called due diligence, which was really just a price arbitrage from an older person at that law firm who was making tons of money off that human being doing work that was really mind-numbingly, um, I mean, uh, I, uh, hats off if you could have done that. I would have, uh, I would have jumped off the, the roof of that building for about you know, two, two uh, hours of doing that. Uh, so what happened is we call that AI. It's really, really not uh, sophisticated technology at all, which is, an, a disco which is a world, again, in the real world called e-discovery. So that's really keyword searching. And so that happened about 20 years ago. And what did that do? It, pretty, it really did transform litigation because no longer did the person at Paul Weiss just send an army of 20 people down to the basement of Aetna when they were doing some massive litigation. 
So now you have some computers doing that. Did that change litigation staffing? Sure. It didn't destroy the litigation model by any means. So now the discussion, in the in, again, on the front lines of this when we're dealing with the banks and the insurance companies about is AI going to do contract management? I think you alluded to that. Well, sure it will. Of, of course it should. Uh, because when, you know, banks are hardly rational actors and they're hardly efficient. Um, however, over time, they're directionally uh, perhaps efficient, and so they will use efficiency tools. Um, but what we disagree with is the notion that somehow AI is going to eat all the lawyer jobs. Um, so that, we think, is a really facile observation. I mean, I don't think there's any evidence that suggests that. What really I think you find in industry after industry, which is, um, remember, email was supposedly going to kill a ton of jobs. Well, guess what? It did kill a a chunk of jobs, and then it created tons of other, uh, you know, a, a ton of other kind of jobs. So we're in the really early innings of where this is going to go and how it's going to affect the law. I, I, I think consistent with that other question you asked, Chris, which is, I think the problem that we see is that legal education, this, uh, with the exception of this panel, which is incredibly interesting to me, and God, I wish I had had this kind of discussion when I was here, instead of, you know, third, third century comparative Bulgarian you know, law, which there was an endowed professorship for. And, you know, I think the last thing, uh, I think somebody told me the last innovation of the law was the Magna Carta. And, 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 and they're probably being generous. Um, you know, I mean, think about legal education, 204 law schools. Do we need that many law schools? Do we really need 40,000 lawyers coming out every year? And by the way, 203 of them try to be this institution, the Langdellian method, as, as this is something we promote as if all, all law schools should be autonomous robots parroting another law school. We should be innovative. We, every single one of those places should be a node of innovation and, and interest and locally rooted. And so that, you know, that's why I think the, the reason I'm not be, uh, bullish on where this is going for the law is because the law has proven itself, you know, data doesn't lie, decade after decade of resisting innovation. And in this case, the data revolution is happening. And so the lawyers and the law students and the legal establishment should not bury its head in the sand like it has typically done at every step of the curve. In fact, there are great uh, stories where you know, lawyers resisted email in the 1990s. They said, I will, my clients will not permit this. My, their sensitive documents uh, in electronic format. They need to be in pouches. You know, you, you, you need to courier them from, you know, firm to, you know, from to the courthouse. So, uh, the, 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 obviously, the question is, it's still pending all of these things in terms of where it's going to go. Uh, I would just say our view is that the, we are moving into a world of what we call value pricing. So, the business of the law for 50 years was the following. It was every law firm cranks units and those are, those are billable hours, and every year that unit price goes up. And so what's your business model? Crank more units. That was my point about the, so it was literally uh, against the business model of the firm to, to do what you were suggesting, even though it logically makes sense. In the halls of Harvard Law School, you do that. In, at Ropes and Gray, you don't do that. Now we're moving into the world of value pricing. So corporations will no longer just accept the price of a legal service. And so now you have this 50-year sclerotic industry trying to sort itself out of, oh my gosh, I actually have to use data, AI, market making and software to determine my value. And so, so that's a long way of saying, we don't know how this is going to actually affect legal education and the law, but it's coming. And so therefore, you know, to your, again, to your great point, Jack, which is in, in five years, the chairman of Paul Weiss, and then I'll stop here, I swear, which is, the chair of Paul Weiss said that the actual practice of the law bears no relation to five years ago. And think about what that means. Paul Weiss is a you know, multi-billion dollar law firm. So the world is changing so rapidly out there, again, on the front lines of this stuff. We just don't know where it'll go. So I, I'm, I'll, I think I'll take the weird role of standing up for, what did you say it was? Third century comparative Bulgarian law studies? Uh, um, that's what I took uh, in my third year. But, uh, you know, <laughs> second year, I was more focused on uh, Estonia. So, yeah, yeah, so, you know, in my time, yeah. we, were, we were already in, you know, 15th century <laughs> comparative Bulgarian law yeah, studies. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, uh, Raj, I think that your, your experience with these law firms is, like, super valuable. But, of course, not all of legal practice is confined to large, very fancy law firms. Firms. Um, and uh, although we may think of much of the law that way, I think that um, 
you know, I was actually pre- thinking for of and preparing for this panel. And I think that, you know, what changed my experience of the law and my ability to practice technology law much more than probably my one year of Java, um, which I will reference in every comment uh, <laughs> just to just to prove my chops to be here, um, is uh, is actually the work that I did in like critical legal studies, in my like classes with Duncan Kennedy, because they prepared me to better understand and unpack the role of like systems in, in cabining our thinking. And I think that good programming classes and good computer science classes can very much teach you those skills. Um, and so I don't want to like only say that Duncan Kennedy or the critical legal movement is the only people who are able to. But I, I think more broadly, this emphasis on you know this specific set of skills, no matter how much it will revolutionize the prof- profession, which I actually do agree that it will for the vast majority of it, um, is a result of the ways in which like technology has is in some senses considered a higher status, like higher value uh, set of skills than law. And that's not actually something lawyers encounter very often. I sort of think occasionally when I am uh, feeling down on uh, down on my practice that I, I went to law school so that I could finally tell technologists what to do and they would have to listen. Um, <laughs> yeah, good which luck they, with Which that they one. don't. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Uh, you know, I, I'm lucky to have clients that don't listen to me. It makes my life more interesting. Um, but I do think that more broadly, we can understand this sort of push towards like law schools thinking about like, should lawyers learn to code? Should lawyers learn about technology? As like a, a change in relationship where law is used to being on top, right? Law is used to, lawyers are used to being the ones in charge. And now actually their profession, their their daily practice, and also like the world around them is getting revolutionized by forces that are not theirs to control. And I think that our way of understanding that should actually not just involve learning about technology, although I think that that's useful, but also like learning about all of the other other t- critical tools that we have to unpack what those how those assumptions work. Um, so like you know if I were uh, you know I if I were trying to tell someone about like what would make them a good public interest technology lawyer right now, um, I might say you know. I probably wouldn't say skip Jack's programming class, um, so yeah. I want to. But uh, I might say skip, you know, skip the CS50, take a critical race theory class because you will learn more that will be relevant to the what you do on an everyday basis in terms of actually predicting the kinds of changes that are going to happen to society as a result of technology than from the sort of everyday practice of like even learning to write an app. There's my controversial statement of the uh, of the panel. That's, that's great. It, it, it actually dovetails a little bit with something I've been thinking about having Mitch here who's teaching kids and the rest of us who I think are teaching about teaching young professionals and professionals to be, which is that I sometimes feel like we're in, I, I wonder if we're in a, 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 an interesting but sort of short term sort of time gap here where we now have students coming into HLS with significantly more tech literacy and even computer programming skills, certainly than when I went to law school 20 years ago, but that when my eight-year-old who loves Scratch goes, God forbid he goes to law school someday, um, uh, he's going to go into law school with much, much, much more tech literacy than your average Harvard Law School 1L today. And so I wonder, is what we're trying to do to kind of, uh, but with courses like Jack's and with some of these other interventions in the law school curriculum sort of bide our time until the young kids that Mitch is teaching kind of catch up to the profession? Or maybe another way to ask it is, is there a difference in thinking about doing this for kids versus doing this for adults? And, and are we some, is that gap someday just going to go away? I don't know if that makes sense. But. No, well, but I, I was thinking about that because yeah, I was yeah, thinking yeah. that if we do our job yes. well, then, yes. then 10 years from now, all the kids, ent- all students entering Harvard Law right. School will have experience doing at least some experience yep. with programming. And I do think that to have some experience is what's most important as opposed to great yeah. expertise where you have some sense. Some of it is to understand what's possible, what's novel, what's, you know, what's you know, unusual, what's not. To be able to have that sensibility, you can get from just having some experience mm-hmm. with it. And I think that increasingly, at least I hope, I mean, it's not for sure, but if we're successful, then most kids will have that experience growing up. And then one can look at how to then enhance that and build upon it. Uh, so and one, maybe it does feel like one thing that's coming out of this panel is there, there, there are these different threads of different reasons for doing mm-hmm. it. Because some is just having some sensibilities about certain ways of thinking. Mm-hmm. Some is having some sensibilities about the way technology is used in the world. Yep. And those are pretty different. Uh, and probably, you know, and you're going to get different things from different levels of engagement with, you know, with programming yep. and other things. Can we, uh, Please. Yep. can we draw out another reason to do it, which sure. I think is related to 
both of these points, sort of uh, Kendra's point about the way that technology confers power in our world right now. Uh, our class is, uh, it's a specific requirement that you never have taken a programming class before, uh, which helps us in practice when you're teaching because people are working with the same uh, background. Uh, but it also means that we're targeting people who might otherwise decline to claim expertise when they uh, mm -hmm. become lawyers and go out in the world. And uh, both I and my co-teacher, Jordi Weinstock, have uh, had the experience of being lawyers and being young lawyers with technical expertise and therefore having the uh, bow uh, balance of power shift in a legal conference room where we have this sort of uh, partners who are, have been there for 40 years and a tech concept will come up and they'll, all the heads will turn to us and all of a sudden we're being listened to in a way that we wouldn't be on any other issue. Uh, and that lets you, uh, lets you do things that matter when you graduate. It, it lets you kind of claim your place in the world. Same thing happens in a fourth grade classroom with the students having <laughs> yeah, the power teaching right, us right. now. Yeah. 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 And, and so when I think about, you know, is our course remedial? Is our course going to go away when, like, if you succeed beyond your wildest dreams, then yes, I think that could happen. But I suspect for a long time, maybe forever, there will be people who hit law school still unwilling to claim that expertise, even when they could. Even when you know, they do have that experience with that technology that they could claim expertise in, but they don't know how to have that voice. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's another, it ought to be another goal of programming education in a legal context to say, like, go out there and grab the power that you can claim mm -hmm. when you're willing to speak up that way. Yeah. Actually, it does relate. When I said earlier, we sometimes think about our work of help people develop their thinking, develop their voice, develop their identity. And we say develop identity, it overlaps with what you're saying about power somewhat. And in fact, we draw that from great literacy movements, like when Paulo Freire in Brazil had literacy movements, it wasn't just to help people get jobs, it was for them to develop a voice to speak up in society and for them to feel they had some power in society. Yeah. So I do think it's very related to that. And just to pull on the like critical theory thread a little more, uh, the participation, for example, of women in computer science programs we know is going down instead of up. And you may remember the statistic better than I do. Is it something like 7% now of women in computer science programs? Uh, something I, that I is like, it's startlingly yeah. bad when yeah. you learn it. Uh, and so I think it, the view that, oh, now all the kids are doing this and everyone's going to come mm. up with it is not reflecting the sort of differential in who's willing to claim it or not claim it in practice right now. We'll say 45 percent of the scratch community is women. Is younger. That's amazing. Women, so. <laughs> well, but but it's active effort to do that. Yeah. So it's an ongoing effort to try to. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I could jump in on yeah. that, which is and and uh, Kendra, to your point, obviously, it's funny because when you say lawyers typically think of themselves as being on top, I have no doubt lawyers do think of that. Oh. <laughs> uh, it, it, in, in corporate world. Nobody thinks the lawyer's on top. <laughs> the, the general counsel's office is not a, it can be a power center, but it is not ever obviously a revenue producer. It is not even C-suite. And so it's interesting. This is, again, the distinction between what our, uh, what our silo of the world thinks and, and, actually, and this is, again, the trends that are happening, which is that's why some general counsel might want to call themselves CLOs, chief legal officers, because they want to be thought of as C-suite. <laughs> so lawyers think of – we think of ourselves in this way, but actually – you know, when you're on the in the board at uh, at a company, it could be a startup board or whatever. Lawyers are ancillary; um, they are they are a necessary function, but they are not critical in a sense to the 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 actual management uh, of the business. And so, um, I think it's an important distinction to make. And of course, that, it would make sense. I mean, B, at the B school, they think that you know, CEO, CFOs and CEOs run the world. And then, you know, Wharton's a big consultant school. They all, you know, they think that way. Um, you, th this discussion about power, though, is interesting because, you know, if you step back and think about, I, I said in my very opening remarks, that I think the law has, has sort of badly failed society. So my line is always that if Alexander Hamilton, who's all the rage now, thanks to Lin-Manuel Miranda, came back, he would be aghast at what actually happened to this gorgeous thing called the law. You know, the law, when it's done well, is what separates us from the animals. I mean, you know, anybody can create an economy and you can have trade and you can have, you know, GDP and all of that. But the law is what separates us from, you know, we literally say lawless nations. Um, you know, my parents come from India. You know, they, when, and they, were at, they were at a newly independent India in the 1940s and they eventually left. They came to America, not just because they wanted to succeed, which they obviously did, but because the law represent, America represented this place where the law worked. My dad... Who you know? Who's uh, you know a very liberal Democrat, but he will say almost these sort of 
a, uh, I don't know, these very patriotic things, which is great, which is like, you know, anybody can make it here, which is why I came here. And I knew in India I couldn't make it the way that I could make it here. But, but uh, is that not a TV? Uh, you can make it anywhere. That's right. uh, but but, but the, the point is the law, because we're, it's a little bit like a, the frog being boiled. We're all told, because we're in this institution, these are the way the, the way that things should be. These are the way things are. But if you step back and think, I, I always have this kind of six words, which was like, you know, uh, poor sucks, middle scared, rich obnoxious. What do I mean by that? The poor get no legal services. And, and I don't want to hear about pro bono. I know it intimately well. We work for AMLA 100 firms. The need of society, and I'm a former civil rights lawyer. I'm a former local elected official. I've worked with, I ran a nonprofit foundation. We gave to co community groups. The need in society for legal services compared to the service delivery is so vast that it, it'll, it'll make you cry if you really think about it. Go to a legal service office in Wichita, Kansas. They are still on like rotary phones and paper. While we're sitting here, you know, uh, you know, while, while we're here, the middle class are generally afraid of lawyers. That means a divorce. That means an accident. And then the rich get, you know, legal services. My wife's rack rate at Proskow, she's a partner there, is eleven twenty-five an hour. Now and now, thanks to Bodala, most companies no longer pay that. Um, and, uh, and 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 frankly, and thanks to Bodala, now law firms are understanding how to price and, and so on. That's a separate discussion. But we should, we really should, and and this is where I'm a bit of a, a school that whenever I speak at a law school, which is. It's incumbent upon us, um, you know, now there's a great awakening on sexual harassment and there's this and there's the notion of being complicit. And we are all complicit in a sense that this legal system is really failing our society. And we should all, it's not, it's not to say shame on me, shame on you, but we need to think about these things. And I do think that technology is a great leveler. That was the great discussion you guys were just having, which is why technology can be so great. Like what you've built with Scratch is, is remarkable, and that's an empowering thing. And so I, I always stress to point this out because I don't think this is ever discussed on a law school campus, which is just the massive asymmetry between what happens here and the need and the supposed claims of what the legal profession actually does. And the reason why it happens is because of the market forces that, that move the axes of the law away from its roots. So and I'll, I'll just say this, is that William Rehnquist in 1986 wrote a law review article in which he decried the rise of law firms that have, wait for it, 300 lawyers and billing requirements of 2,000 hours a year. My wife billed 3,300 when she was a third year at Debevoice, and that's why she's now a partner at a law firm. And the reason he said that was not because it was immoral. He said the ethics constraints are too great because when the market pressures are so severe, the ethics actually can't stand up for what legal ethics uh, that are rooted in the profession. So because of the market pressures, we've actually had a system that's gone a little bit awry. I do think that technology can be an empowering point to get the law back to its roots, which is when it's done well and it's its best self, is one of the most remarkable systems that you know, the humans have ever created. We've talked, uh, great points, we've talked about a couple of different ways that we think about um, educating uh, students and others uh, about technical topics and coding in particular. And, and there's obviously a distinction here between sort of general purpose intro to coding, coding courses, either for kids or like, like Scratch or, or Kendra alluded to the CS50 course, which is a very well-known course that's taught at the college here that a lot of students from frankly around the world, but certainly around the university can go teach, uh, go, go, go take. Uh, and I remember when Jack was getting his class up and running, we had some conversations about this, about what what is the distinction between Doing, doing something like Scratch, going to an online learn how to program in Python class, cross-registering in CS50, and then taking a dedicated class that, that t looks at technology as applied to something particular specific, which in this case is law. If you're a grad student at the business school, you could imagine a technology for business students course. If you're a grad student at the grad school of education, you could imagine a technology for education students course. So um, Jack or anyone else, do you want to talk a little bit about that, about what, what, what you think is beneficial about sort of the very targeted approach that you're taking versus the sort of the broad approach? Sure. Uh, so I think the power that we're seeing emerge as we put together last year's class was the, the power of the case method, the sort of familiar law school approach of the kind of uh, take real situations and debate them and learn from them and then build an idea of how the world works from that. Uh, so I'll sort of highlight uh, a couple of uh, hypos that we used in the class. Uh, I mentioned the immigration hypo. 
And what we do is we go through a, an introductory Python uh, language textbook, and each chapter we learn the chapter and then have some hypo that comes from it. Uh, our hypo uh, for, for branching statements in programming uh, involved immigration and involved a 2013 bill that was proposed and ultimately failed that offered a path to citizenship. If you go online, you can find all these complex flowcharts of how people were supposed to follow the path to citizenship from start to end. Uh, and what we did is we, we generated sort of a thousand anonymous people in a spreadsheet. And we said, you represent a nonprofit who has a constituency of immigrants who would like to take advantage of a possible path to citizenship. Uh, you want to understand how this bill would affect your constituents. So write a program that will look at these people and figure out uh, how many of them would successfully be you know, able to follow this path that's proposed in this statute. Uh, and then for some of our students who had an easier time with that, we said, take a next step and start uh, modifying the proposed bill and find the smallest modification you can that will have the biggest impact for your constituents. So, oh, if we just change this from a two-year requirement to one-year requirement, then 20% of our constituents would then be eligible. But this mm -hmm. won't look like a large request in, in terms of the... Uh, uh, the lobbying for the bill. So we're kind of using computation to understand how people think about lobbying. And it, if you think about... It's uh, sort of like a model. As a model, right. It's kind of the but, way you'd... Uh, yeah, okay. But, but linked to something very real because it's not like we invented the statute to highlight this programming exercise. Like, it really <laughs> was applicable. Yeah. Uh, cool. So, and, and then we could kind of get into... Uh, students start proposing, oh, I think this would be a small change. I think that would be a small change. Then you can say, well, okay, so why was that set there? Why does that farm exception exist? Actually, there's this powerful lobby that will only make this possible. And what you thought was a small change is really a large one. So as you explore the flowchart with your program, you start to see that there's a social structure around it. Uh, and that's, it's, it's so linked to uh, law and computer programming. Uh, I do want to get to the second hypo. So if you have a I, actually, can, I, I do want to say that. Let me put my former mm -hmm. politician hat on. That's a game changer. So if you <laughs> walked into my office as a legislator, and instead of just having usually some talking point that say you should vote for HB 34 or whatever, and you had a model, and I could say, oh, if you tweak this amendment, this is the actual like dynamic time effect. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's amazing. I mean, like sure. you know, if, if yeah, I, t I was criticizing the law. Wait till you get to a legislature on being backwards. Uh, you know, uh, right, right. Let, let's just say information does not flow dynamically uh, okay. on the floor of a, a, of a house. And, and, and when we talk about power, yeah. bear in mind that tax laws are already constructed this way for some people. Health insurance laws are already constructed this way for the people who have those resources. Uh, who has access to this kind of analysis and who doesn't shapes what the oh. law does. Yeah. Uh, but I, I know it. Let me get in one more because I'm so proud of this. And I, <laughs> uh, the, the next week, we had a new hypo, and we wanted to analyze uh, sort of on the computer programming side, how do you uh, cross-reference data and put data in dictionaries? And uh, the hypo that we came up with was you work for an immigration enforcement agency, and you've come in possession of an anonymous data set of 1,000 people who uh, are undocumented immigrants. Uh, which, of course, was our spreadsheet from the previous hypo. Your task this week is to correlate it with an FBI database and de-anonymize those people so you can enforce the immigration law. Uh, and the hope of that series is, is to say that these things that we write, uh, that when we look at data and programs and things that feel abstract, if you switch the frame a little bit, all of a sudden it's terrifying what power they have. Uh, and I though I think our immigration system is, is deplorable. I, that wasn't the point I was trying to make, that their immigration system is deplorable. The point I was trying to make is whether you like this or not, you have to respect the power of it. Uh, and my, my sort of best self, when I, if I walk out thinking, I hope that that class went well, I hope that a hundred times as those people go through their careers, they see a pile of data and say, wait, I've seen this before. I have to think so much more carefully about what this means in the computational context that we're in now. And that's why I tell people they should take Jack. Yeah, <laughs> I'm signing up. That's, that's awesome. That's yeah, this awesome. could be the year to learn Python for real. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, you want to jump in on? Yeah, well, actually, yeah, a few things. I also yeah. really like those examples. I think yeah. it does highlight several things that we'd already talked about. Because I think in going through those examples, people are first, again, some understanding of systems and processes. Mm -hmm. Also, they, they understand the power of being able to tinker with them. Because again, one thing that I think is special about certain things computationally, you're providing them the opportunity to try things out, play what-if games in ways that you oftentimes can't in other things as, as easily, which can be compelling. But then you can also see the potential 
dangers of people using that in ways that there are always implicit assumptions in a lot of the things that are built into the models. So also the challenge of models. Models are powerful for convincing a legislator, but also can be deceptive. Mm-hmm. And it, I was right. I was really, this years ago, there was this article, uh, it was called Seductions of Sim. It was by Paul Starr, who was a sociologist, first yeah. here at, at, at Harvard, then at Princeton. Mm-hmm. And he was in the early days of the Bill Clinton administration, uh, with, and he was a healthcare economist helping out. He said that as he was you know, in these meetings, something was triggering that he was recognized some deja vu, and he realized he was noticing the similarities between his kids were using SimCity at home, mm-hmm. uh, and then he was seeing these similar types of simulations. But it then struck him, he knew that in SimCity there were these biases built in. It was like always good to decrease tax rates. <laughs> the kids were learning in SimCity the value of yeah. tax rates because it was built That was the model. Reagan revolution. Right. Yeah. There we go. So it's, we're still awesome. stuck in this. Yeah. <laughs> so he sort of became aware of, but then people were just, in the things he was doing in Washington and the healthcare, people were just assuming that this was real because a computer generated it. Fascinating. Yeah. So being able to have students understand the seductions mm-hmm. of both the power and the, sedu- and the potential problematic seductions. <laughs> Of models. Yeah, I have, there's this quote I really like, which is, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, <laughs> that's good. And, that's good. Uh, yeah, I think that's actually one of the things I really like to teach my students, is that, like, the your instincts about things not feeling right, or things not, like, you should never let, like, the fact that you don't totally understand the thing get in the way of actually asking good questions and digging into the material. Mm-hmm. Like, the idea, you know, I do think that all the time people, uh, we hear the equivalent of, like, well, a computer produced it, so it must be right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that scares me a lot. And I hope that one of the reasons I really want people to learn about technology is so that they learn that that statement is wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and that so that they can unpack this idea of, you know, just because it's a, we call it a risk score, um, and we we use it to evaluate whether somebody should get probation or not, and it's no longer we it's a risk score instead of sentencing guidelines. The fact that a computer is involved doesn't make it more accurate or less susceptible to bias, um, and I think that you know actually for folks who haven't encountered technology a lot, that can be a really revolutionary idea, because we are meant to think we are um, many people do think of technology as like relative as not really being constructed by people as sort of not having inherent assumptions or like biases or and sort of being immune to those kind of things. And so, you know, that's why I think, you know, technological literacy is important, but, you know, getting like get falling so in love with the technology that you forget mm-hmm. how real it is for real people. And that's what I love about Jack's examples yeah. is uh, is really scary to me. And that's one of the things I like try to impress upon my students with mm-hmm. varying degrees of success. But just go ahead, John. I think that's such an awesome point because we have we see that bias where our clients will say, well, what does your algorithm say? Yeah. Yeah. And then and they'll they'll want like it's, you know, the Oracle, you know, and then I was like, as it says the cowboy should win this week. You know, I you know so I well, and then we have to do this like funny because you know we're data folks, we have data scientists, and then we have to play lawyer and we have to say, stop thinking that the magic box will tell you the exact mm-hmm. price of what that M&A matter should cost. Think directionally. Mm-hmm. So what the data does is give you nodes, and it tells you you shouldn't overpay. That shouldn't be a $1.7 <laughs> million matter, but it should be based on some nodes, 350 to 500 but there's a reason it could get up to 800 But you have to think a little bit more uh, critically, and you know, I think the best example of that are the FICO scores. You know, people think there's some great, you know, magic Oz that, you know, and think what the role of credit does in our society, how how hurtful it is. Um, and, you know, that was some sort of like kind of loose technology that a private corporation set up that now runs the world. Um, and, um, and now we have to regulate against it. We have to fight about it and so on because it was a false god that the da- that data was pure. Um, so I think that point is super well taken. And I see it every day in, in our business. Big data is made of people. I'm full of aphoros- aphorisms. Man, I'm sorry. You need to write up a book on yeah, this. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah, 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 that's good. That's good. Big data is full of.